Good. We can all hear you too. There's okay. There's a room full of people here listening to you. So, <laughs> so yeah. So please welcome Nancy Marofluda. She'll be presenting the aesthetics of transmissions all the way from Singapore. So. <laughs> Hi. Uh, this is the last slot, um, obviously, so I hope you can bear with. Um, I'll just jump to it because I guess it's been a long three days and lots of information. Um, so there's no secret in contemporary culture, you know, that it's obsessed with inspiring, provocative, rising images. But this doesn't adequately acknowledge the ubiquity of our network culture in all its manifestations. Um, on the other hand, those who practice and are informed by uh, programming languages of information technology rarely ever see a connection or, or yeah, to the visual aesthetic discourse. So in most cases, aesthetic concerns uh, are seen as an anathema or greedy, time-wasting, you know, CPU doing bells and whistles, the thing you worry about at the end. So this historical conundrum between this, you know, black box uh, duping apparatus and suspicious expertise is located by Barbara Stafford. And she uh, locates this and says that these, that people might be the, the digital mage and proposes their practice might mediate or heal um, this fractured, ghettoized area, right? So I'll come back to this in a minute. But transmission as defined technically is, as we, many of us know probably in the room, is signal transfer from one or many locations by means of signal, light, electrical waves, so on. So that being so, an aesthetic of transmission backgrounds this technical definition and foregrounds the emergent forms which are not premised on the visual but nonetheless less often visually engaging. So an aesthetics of transmission partakes in the verve beyond light waves, electrical data, and suggests a haptic or post-optical stance that lies beyond or through the primary sense spectrums, being visual and oral communication, but resides in the actual unfolding experience of such signals as indicators of the haptic or the sen uh, secondary senses. So we're always shifting our perception and action uh, from one mode of sensory experience to another. Uh, and meanings themselves are often um, mediated in transmission, are articulated through this nex nexus of embodied experience, right? So the use of relay in transmission as an electrical mechanical device or transistor is of a different order to relaying a message. So a relay is a switch that connects two circuits, right, does not necessarily transmit a message. So to transmit a smoke signal or chant a song out at sea or put a message in a bottle may only potentially reach an audience. So like relay and code, transmission is a broadly used term, but its usage derives from Latin, meaning across or beyond, and it originated um, you know, denoting the sending of the Holy Spirit out into the world. So one of the motivations for me for developing uh, and being inspired by people who discuss these potential other ways of um, thinking about aesthetics is the desire to put push consciousness deeper into the assemblage of code and human perception, right, in the age of this ubiquity of and networks that we are experiencing. So the spread of the communicative field is not wholly complete. 
and one cannot predict every instance nor control the production and reception of every variable in sending a code or a signal, nor in the multitude of ways in which they may traipse. Uh, therefore, I'm going to discuss an artwork which I think um, is situated at the very horizons of this transmission aesthetics, uh, where meaning kind of flickers on and off like a relay switch or an interrupted signal transmission. And um, I propose that this aesthetic accommodates this artwork that even deliberately explores such an excess of transmission, a transmission gone um, awry, that is dissonant, does not reach its target, right? So it shape shifts to reach its receiver. So an aesthetics of transmission assumes that a perfectly pure transmission is imaginary and reverberates in the realm of make-believe intermediaries. And it serves often indescribable results. So the position here is to understand both the complexities of the arcane world, which also includes omens, interpretation of forces, uh, vibrations and other elements, right, in this um, realm, which I can imagine you've been talking about the last few days, where obviously access to the ether is prescribed and commoditized, right? Um, so... In this talk, I'm acknowledging transmission to be many other things than a simple broadcast or a potential message one-to-one, -one. so as these signals echo and rebound through frequencies. Without um, disputing its role of information, this highlights how an aesthetic of transmission is concerned with what transpires when there is interference, acknowledging um, that these gaps scars, interference zones, access points, which actually start an exchange. So the point is that an indefinable transmission uh, signals have the potential to be meaningful in and of themselves as we tune into listening for the sound of our own kindred spirits, a sign meant for us uh, in the telepathic field. This may be momentarily contains the space of your being. And it's not just about becoming visible, which is important, but it's also about refining and those skills or the perception to tune in to remote presences. So with that said, I want to talk about the apotheosis of the transmission aesthetics, which is uh, this artwork, which many of you might know, Delivery from Mr. Assange. And I'll give an account of how I stumbled across it on my um, tuning in moment. So this this work uh, was a 32-hour live telematic or mail art piece um, performed in January 2013. And the reason I found out about it was uh, I just received an email with a very simple URL posted to um, a mail list, which I run with as you can see, this URL. So I followed it to discover this performance unfolding on the project website, which displayed every 10 seconds images from a package travelling from the borough of Hackney addressed to Julian Ann Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. And at the time, everyone was like, what's going on in there? Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry to, dis uh, to in interrupt you, but Nancy, your presentation is still on slide one, so I didn't know if you... Oh, that? yeah, sorry. There we go. Okay. Got it? Yeah. Yeah. Now we see it. Just, you just got to put Thanks. it. <laughs> All right. Where are we are. Oh my God. That would have been so boring. I'm so okay. sorry. <laughs> I should have to, told you sooner. There you go. I, wasn't sure. okay. thing. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Just tell me when it stops. So here, here's the email, right? And here's the, uh, I don't know, <laughs> quote. Yeah, you're good. Um, you're good now. You're good. <laughs> you just have to hit the play button on right. it. and then. So here we are. Yeah, we got the email. Right. This is the package. Yeah. So, you know, it's a custom-made performance tool consisting of a camera. You can see the dot there, right, which was documenting its journey. And this network performance, the reason I'm referencing this work, which uh, many of you may know about and may have experienced 
as well with me in another uh, continent in, on the planet, um, was this was experienced alone in my home in an island south um, of Australia, Tasmania, right, together with a remote audience. So, you know, it soon became clear that many others were engaged in this durational artwork when following the group's Twitter handle and the Twitter feed. Um, you know, so the, the artists were clearly, um, you know, providing handles uh, for this experience, right? So as well as utilising the postal system, this delivery of Mr Assange inhabits both all of these channels where a conversation took place, fostering kind of a building understanding of what was unfolding as the images were being uploaded to the project site from the parcel as it travelled from the postal network through all of our computers networked simultaneously on another a level. Can, uh, can you see the change now? In... Slide? Uh, uh, nope, it's still on the Bitnik slide. I think uh, you have to hit play on the presentation is all, and then it'll work. I'm going to do uh, that one. Can you see it now? Yeah. yeah, now we see it. Yeah, I guess just when you switch to the next slide, just... Uh, yeah, I'll yeah, just get this. It's just important, right? Because this, uh, <sighs> these tableaus are important, um, you know, because they added to the dramatic situation. The images were not being aimed at being this flawlessly composed epic masterpiece, but instead their function was to capture and engage a network of people to gather momentum to all who were travelling through a trajectory in space and time momentarily through 10-second glimpses. Um, so this blackout you know, would add to the anticipation, was the parcel intercepted and, and so forth, right, and could this really reach Assange in real time? So this fleck, right, we can see here in this light creeping into the, the frame to show its passage was not unlike uh, tenebrism that in, in painting, right, this style of painting developed by Caravaggio and other artists. Um, characterised by dark tones and shadows with dramatically contrasting effects of light. I'm just going to check that you've got that. You got that? Yeah. You got that? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that worked. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to say yes. I'm just showing, you know, some classic tenebrous thing. I thought I'd, you know, include some nice pictures to keep you all uh, in tune there. Um, so on Latin, tenebrae means shadows and darkness, right? The term tenebrae also refers traditionally to the ritual lighting and extinguishing of candles. Um, so the Latin in the void metaphor, okay? Are you seeing status unchanged still in Vauxhall, same image? Yeah? All right. Yes, Nancy, we are. Sorry, I have to come up. So, so, you know, this this uh, genre, this 20th century, you know, we see it applied in 20th century with, you know, the, the Frank Miller graphic novel and other things, and now we can see it in um, the work of not media group Bitnik. So now we can understand, hopefully, how uh, thoroughly that this... Um, tenebrous application played into this networked artwork. So here's some of the short excerpts. Um, so another angle of, of how the work unfolded for the people that um, haven't seen this work. Right, so... You know, there's light again, there's blurred images, right? So it's not, as I mentioned, worrying about this um, epic masterpiece kind of image. It's like a sequence. It's a performance unfolding in a kind of tableau, series of tableaus. So, right, another interesting thing is when the parcel arrived at the embassy, the way that um, the target came to receive it revealed the beauty of transmission aesthetic as well. Right, so it was a live unfolding, um, and the receiver began to play along with the package as a live performance tool and a communication 
system for obviously more tactical things. But this is the precise combination of what makes this piece for me an apotheosis of the uh, aesthetics of transmission. So the the parcel clearly um, arrived into the hands of Assange and he aimed the mini camera, bringing in the frame and bringing in, you know, a picture of a tiger. I'm just doing this so it reboots the stream or whatever it is. Um, it, you know, then a puppet, then a cow, and then then he began to um, transmit his political slogans, right? So at first it was a playful engagement, which was uh, important to uh, the aesthetics of transmission that I'm talking about here today. But, you know, this, this influences how we are naturally inclined to interact and use these technologies and how these interactions um, have an impact rather than this, you know, direct a message. So offering a counterpoint to a one-way transmission. Um, so in this way, you know, the audience had a topical reason for tuning into the artwork and it corresponded with the desire of the people addressed through this open participatory nature for those who knew about this situation and also the chance meeting in this ambient kind of subculture or computer subculture communing together across time zones, borders and realm, um, removed from this purely aesthetic abstraction but made comparable to the concrete context of this spectator experience in this critical reception, right, in favour of um, rather than identification per se, it was more in favour of a vast understanding and awareness of what communion may mean in the 21st century, right? Um, I'm just doing that. So rather than, you know, the epic optical masterpiece, this idea of awareness and vast um, understanding. Okay, so this uh, aesthetics of transmission opens to the spectator to other times and registers of existence and entanglement of experience. So in a similar way, you got that? Adrian McKenzie wirelessness opens the spectator to other times and um, he conceives wirelessness as this entanglement of experience, right, that um, effervesces or foams rather than flows in a one-way direction. Um, so, yeah, the dispersing of action, the website feeding into email groups, live tweets and text built vibrancy, of the post which travelling through the space and the ongoing description with Twitter with conversations of infrastructure, logistics, comments on, you know, the colours and the protocols demonstrates how the aesthetics of transmission can be understood in the context of contemporary art forms and how this type of visual communication is as much about sensing other people's reactions and feelings um, to Twitter feeds and where can images as they're tuning in, right? So the hovering layer of meta reports unfolded over time and built further and um, enabled a receiver to experience information and tune in, right, uh, across temporal and physical boundaries, right, for those who were able. So the act of transmission is never simple because it subverts and destabilises a relationship between the emitter and receiver, but um, the meaning frequently oscillates between points of understanding. So this is what makes it significant, uh, is that the audience members who were close in terms of uh, distance and those who were able to tune in to many other remote presences, um, you know, shows the importance of these, this cultural performance and this embodied subject in the practices, medias, media and conceptual frameworks that make up contemporary art forms. So the aesthetics of transmission is not about simply seeing, right, but experiencing connections and movement patterns and mixed realities, so um, it highlights this haptic mode of perception, 
And, um, you know, I'm arguing that it's maybe even more relevant to contemporary art forms nowadays than this traditional scophophilic modality of viewing art per se. So this perception of an artwork privileges this way of being. Um, so in that sense, um, this, I hope, you know, I've introduced some questions about uh, assumed aesthetics and the acknowledging, you know, the acknowledging of the network apparatus emphasises this overdue perceptual shift in reception and these omnipresent uh, transmissions and signals, uh, you know, even perhaps a new kind of fictocritical species that exist within us forming new habitats drives, forms, structures and cosmographies. So I leave you there because I think um, we might have had a long three days and I'm open to questions. I don't know how much of that you got or not. <laughs> yeah, Nancy, that must have been really, it's always difficult to do a remote presentation, but thank you for staying up until the middle of the night <laughs> to do it. Um, does anyone have any questions for Nancy? I think we're, I think you covered it all for us. <laughs> yeah. Also, you're the last talk of Radical Network, so it's a very, uh, <laughs> you're wrapping it up. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>